I met Perrin the following, uh, it has to be 1945, that the war is coming to an end and there's going to be expansion of all public health programs. He was thinking of his good relation mm -hmm. with Roosevelt and venereal disease was, was the center of it and uh, I remember they mentioned tuberculosis. Could you uh, just elaborate a little, you mentioned earlier about the parents' uh, thoughts that venereal disease shouldn't be just, quote, a social disease, disguising right. that. It had to come out in the open. Right. And Perrin was the first to put that in the, the press after he assumed office in, I dare say, 1935, or it may have been earlier. <clears throat> See, uh, Roosevelt came to office in 1933. Right. And uh, that whole year, 1934, was taken up with uh, just saving the American dollar. And then the following year was to create artificial jobs, uh, uh, yeah. getting people out to do something. And then they could settle uh, with uh, the Secretary of Labor, Perkins. She was the one that was the dynamo behind uh, Perrin to getting these social programs out mm -hmm. and getting them budgeted. And she, if anybody deserves a, keeping Social Security in front of the, the uh, new Surgeon General, it was Perkins. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, it was health care. And, uh, you know, Roosevelt wanted health care, but the uh, Russell the senator from uh, uh, Georgia uh, said he didn't think that the southern states would go for health care for all, the, making the excuse, we don't have enough money, we're spending so much money on the war. It sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Russell uh, uh, kept Roosevelt from moving ahead with Medicare, let's put it that way. So Roosevelt, I mean, as you recall it or know it, was fairly progressive on on health matters then, if he was thinking of pub President Roosevelt now, yes. public health and yes. even a, a national health yeah. program. He, he, a lot of that he learned from the Southern senators that were his big support in getting his him elected in the nomination over Al Smith, mm -hmm. who was the, the prime candidate, because Smith had run for president in 1928, but Hoover had beat him badly, and Smith felt he was entitled to a second chance, but Roosevelt felt this, he had lined up the southern states, right. and this was going to be uh, his reward to the southern states for getting them started, getting a health program that would fit their needs, and then Perkins with Social Security. June 1945, the war is, is, is over in Europe. The Germany is surrendered. Smashed. Yeah. And then the war in the Pacific still exists. Uh, Japan is asked to surrender and they refuse. And uh, I gather I'm going to be assigned to Kansas City to be a backup health facility if there is big casualty coming out of the invasion of Japan. That's what we were told, that there would be enormous number of casualties if we have to attempt to land in Japan. Oh, so they were building up a, a like hospital and recovery. Oh, yeah, all through 
the West, Western Mississippi was to be the big receiving area for the United States for the casualties that uh, they estimated the Japanese would fight right to the very last right. person, as they had demonstrated all through the Pacific Isle. Uh, so, but then Mountain, uh, Joe Dean, uh, I told Joe Dean what was going to happen to me. Uh, Joe Dean had been my executive officer, and Joe said... Now this was in Puerto Rico, or Joe Dean was your executive uh, officer in, in Puerto, Rico. Puerto Rico? The first one. Right. The second one was Holloman, third one was uh, John Porterfield. So I got to know three top guys, and they all got to know me well. And uh, Mountain then called me in, and I know Joe Dean had set it up, and uh, said a few nice things about my performance. Now and Joe Dean was in Washington at that time yeah, then? Yeah, uh, so. Joe Mountain had called Joe Dean up to be his executive officer for the Bureau of State Services. So Joe Dean was uh, a visionary in the sense that all states should have full complements of public health workers. Yeah, well, was that plan like the federal government would assist states in that, getting these? That, that was it, yeah. yeah. That was Perrin, and right. that was Roosevelt. And then uh, Mountain called me in in uh, September 1945. And then he said, well, uh, tell me what you're going to do. And then after talking some 15 minutes, 20 minutes, he said, uh, put this in a white paper that I can use in budget planning and a discussion at a higher level in the Public Health Service and that backs me up in any congressional hearing I may have. And actually I was just overwhelmed that they were talking about doing this as a policy making thing, the kind of thing I dreamed about, but I didn't think that my God it come to be. Say a little bit about what your vision was. What was what were you telling Joe Mountain? You had told oh, Joe him. Mountain. I said that the animal reservoir of disease is second to none, except man. At that time, we hadn't had all these studies on evolution. I said and ticked off uh, the rabies and tuberculosis and brucellosis and foodborne salmonella had just come into the picture then. So I could quote those and Mountain just uh, listened and wanted uh, a paper describing all of this. Then uh, this was uh, uh, the fall of 1945 and uh, as, uh, suddenly, I get a telephone call from uh, the Department of Agriculture that uh, high secret. Oh, uh, I guess they had announced that I was going to be a head of veterinary public health. Mountain had asked me, he said, what are you going to call yourself after he read my report? And I had told that story, I saw the sign, Dental Public Health, down the hall from it. You know, let me interrupt because you had told me this earlier, but yeah. since we're recording it, you had gone to CDC in Atlanta at that time. Am they I had correct? sent me down there to look at MCWA. They hadn't changed the name to CDC yet. Oh. And they said, well, well uh, Mark Hollis had said, well, he's an engineer, and he said, there's a good place for you here. And that was like November. And MC, what did that stand for? Before? Malaria Control in War Areas. Oh. That was set up by Louis Williams. And it's so, it was, 
it really blossomed after the the war. Then to yeah, take to the mountain and, saved it because ordinarily they would uh, you know scrub the <coughs> budget and eliminated it mm -hmm. and brought it all back to Washington. Mountain with his foresight, and I get this from Joe Dean that he had the foresight to see that he could plan something as an alternative to NIH. NIH wanted to be a research center. They didn't want to be a service center. Mm -hmm. Mountain wanted a service center for any disease outbreaks that <coughs> they could go to and get assistance. And then he sent me down there. But as the end of 45 came about, I got this secret call from agriculture, and as I said, that they, my title had appeared that I was going to be the CBO, Chief Veterinary Officer, and uh, that's what I, uh, the only reason I can say that they called me. And they said, could I keep in mind to backstop them if I had any Spanish-speaking veterinarians? And I had one. Uh, the name of Aurelia Malaga Alba. He was an Indian Peruvian. And he was out at NIH for me. Full Indian. It was supposed to be working on Brucella, brucellosis. And I said, and then I kind of forgot uh, that I had this liaison with uh, agriculture. I had kept them well informed of everything I was doing. I didn't want to stumble. <laughs> and sometime after the first year, maybe April, a mountain called me in one day and he said, we got this call from down on the border, Texas and Mexico, that this <coughs> FMD or foot and mouth disease is spreading and is this a public health problem? He's asking me, and I said, well, it's a matter of how you interpret data because I had made it my business earlier in, when I was in school to read the outbreak that occurred in the United States in 1914 when it appeared in uh, Indiana just south of the Michigan border and then spread all over the United States caused a hell of a lot of disruption. And in that outbreak, there had been human cases among the veterinarians attending. And these were treated by people at Johns Hopkins and written up in a, their journal of dermatology. So I could refer them to that. And uh, he said, well, he said, I wasn't there, he bound and said something to the effect, do you know anything about this? Uh, we asked everybody around the service, nobody seems to know. Uh, why don't you go down to Mexico and find out what's going on and tell me? <laughs> the mountain had called me in. Uh, and he said, you know, the federal government is seizing some properties. Uh, I want you to go look at them to see if they'll fit uh, your needs for setting up a rabies research laboratory. And every one of them was hunting lodges or fine summer homes <laughs> or even uh, upstate New York and Connecticut. And uh, I said to myself, this doesn't fit setting up a destroying a property to put a rabies program on it. I didn't tell anybody what my inner feeling was. I just uh, <coughs> let people uh, know that I was looking for a good place. Mm -hmm. And my good fortune was I ran into Harold Johnson of the Rockefeller Foundation at a meeting in Washington or New York, it's hard for me to remember. And I was telling Harold, who had a great reputation 
as a rabies researcher. He had been doing this for the Rockefeller Foundation for the late 30s, say from 35 to 45. And uh, he was doing this under a, a, another medical officer, uh, Charles Webster. I think it was Charles Webster, a uh, high-ranking man that had, was well respected in the uh, Rockefeller research uh, area. And Harold says to me, they're going to be closing the rabies laboratory at uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And that was the first I, I had heard that that was being dismantled. And I had heard vaguely about the uh, Rockefeller laboratory, but didn't know much about it. And Harold and I uh, had been standing in the hall at this meeting for some 15 minutes, maybe, talking about it. And he said, uh, Harold at that time was using a cane. He was recovering from what they call uh, uh, bat rabies. And he had a bite. A lot of people always questioned, was that so? Uh, I always believed him, oh, it was so, that he was recovering. And we sat down and talked for another half hour. And he said, if you want this, I'll recommend to the Rockefeller people in New York, or through my uh, channel, that the Public Health Service, CDC, is interested in creating a rabies laboratory and carrying our work forward. And I said, Harold, that would be the greatest blessing I ever could have. Right. So I went back and told Mark Hollis, who was then head of CDC, Mark says, good Lord, you move fast. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to talk to him, tell him about all my concern about getting all these high-priced places that I was going to turn down and tell Mom none of these would fit my needs. And Mark Hollis then could tell Mom, he said something in the effect, this guy really moves, that <laughs> being me. Right. So then I had to get a staff together, and that's when I hired Ernie Turkle, who was attending a meeting in New York at the New York Academy of Science. And the subject was zoonoses, put on by Cornell University to get uh, different people interested in it. Did I put the meeting on? No. But a lot of people were giving me credit and saying, Gosh, this is great that you promoted this idea so fast. And uh, I was not being complimented by everybody, but <laughs> some people said, Gosh, you're doing things. And Mountain and Joe Dean and Mark Hollis. Suddenly I had a laboratory and I had something to do. And it was working. I was struck by that story because the theme throughout this was how while opportunities almost came up by chance, yes, you were but innately you clever enough, right, to seize these opportunities. And, and you, for all those near misses you've described about your career and developing the ca career. You caught it right there. Right, that you, 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 did, you did put it all together at the right time and the, with the right place. Exactly. I uh, somehow mountain arranged for me to speak at the Surgeon General's conference where all <laughs> the high-ranking officers were, including uh, Eugene Dyer, the head of NIH, and anybody that could shoot me down. <laughs> well, now, when was this, Jim? When was this? Oh, it must have been like April uh, 1946. Uh -huh. I got this... Uh, it's hard to say, do it. I have the Rockefeller Laboratory in hand. I don't think I did yet. I don't think that was culminated until June, uh, a couple months later. 
but I made it my business to compliment everybody in the public health service for what they were doing with rabies control, including uh, the NIH, where I was working under Carl Havel and learning how to differentiate different vaccines and why they failed and so forth. And I remember when the session was over, a tiger came to me with kind of a grin on his face and said, I think you'll fit in. <laughs> and what was Dyer at the time? What he was, was the head of NIH. Ah, right. yeah, the top right. of NIH. Who else would he meet, right? right. <laughs> so again, I was saying the right things, and there were people were said, I was living up to what people were saying about me. That's what it amounts to. Would you mention that, Jim? You, you told me that the other day before we were getting this informal videotape about why things could happen at the end of, of World War II. Yeah. Could you give, just recapitulate that for... Everyone you talk to at the end uh, say, we're going to create a better nation. We're going to create a better world. Uh, Roosevelt with the United Nations and the first meeting that was held in April uh, 9th, or June. Uh, no, it was April, April in San Francisco, where they laid the groundwork for the United Nations. Because uh, this was Roosevelt's last wish. Uh, it was, mm -hmm. So it was a matter of almost uh, falling uh, one year after his death. And they were going to get this thing moving. And then they... Uh, uh, of uh, sub, the various subdivisions of the United Nations. The World Health Organization was the thing that they could start acting on immediately because health conditions of Europe and the world. And I remember uh, a fellow named uh, uh, Donahue. He was uh, uh, chief of foreign quarantine and traveled extensively and had been in and out of Europe. And he made contact with me about uh, the psittacosis issue and so on. He was circulating a memo that anybody that had any ideas for United Nations you know, send the memo on to him. He was to be the aide-de-camp to Tom Perrin, who was going to be the Surgeon General. Uh, of the, of uh, not the WHO, but the presiding officer for organizing the World Health Organization. And that I did, that there should be a veterinary public health section in the newly created uh, World Health. And I remember. Uh, that I wasn't invited to the meeting, it was New York in June, and after the meeting I saw Donahue again at uh, another emergency issue about uh, the war in Vietnam and the French retreating and all. Oh, there were so many issues going on. And having that title of Chief Veterinary Officer I was constantly being informed what was being uh, and asked to make uh, any contribution from my point of view. Yeah.